Since I happen to have recently purchased a pack of five or six mystery DVDs from a bull moose up in Portland, uh, so we'll definitely be doing reviews of those as sort of like a little mini episode kind of thing. Um, and actually, in fact, now is probably the perfect time to do the inaugural poll. So, uh, hey, James. Yes, Katie. Let's pick a DVD. Mmm. Mmm. Let me get in there. No peeking. I can't tell if I'm touching the proper side or the not proper side. I mean, they're all over each other. It doesn't matter. What do we got? Samantha, an American girl holiday. I'm not on screen right now. Ah, so that'll be fun. Yep, we'll be doing a review of that movie. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> hey, fans. Welcome back to an incredibly strange Katie. Katie and Katie. It doesn't really work as great when we're... There's a little bit of lag. Uh, yeah, you may know. No, 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 it's okay. Do it again. Do it again. I'll be good this time. Hello, fans. Welcome back to a very strange Katie. Katie and Katie. <laughs> you may you may have noticed at this point that we're uh, we're not in the same room or even we're barely even in the same town. Uh, numbers have been going up in our little corner of the universe for the covid whole thing and on top of that the script that i thought i wrote last week apparently didn't save so uh, that, i'm just kind of mumbling my way through womp, this. Womp. katie's making sad trombone noises but the point is we're finally back two holiday seasons after we announced that we would be watching an american girl holiday samantha an american girl samantha an american girl holiday uh, back in, what, summer of 2019? The point is, especially in light of all of this and cinema's not really being an option right now, we're sort of relying on other sources for films to talk about. It seemed like the perfect time to sit down and talk about Samantha and American Girl Holiday. The Holiday Classic. Roll clip. It is the year 1904, and Samantha Parkington lives with her grand Mary in the affluent Mount Bedford, New York. Still grieving from the sudden and highly suspicious, if you ask me, deaths of her mother and father, Samantha's life takes a turn for the better when she becomes fast friends with the neighbor's new child servants, only to be ripped away by her well-to-do uncle guard to a glamorous new life in the Big Apple. Can Samantha learn to navigate big city life? save her new old friends from the orphanage, and defeat child labor and class disparity in time for Christmas? No, but maybe she can do some of those things. Find out in Samantha, an American girl holiday. So, so, uh... Unlike, I mean, we've been, we've been sort of foregoing casting for a while now, uh unless something really stood out to us. I'm not mm -hmm. gonna even, I don't even know who the director or screenwriter was and they probably are fine with that. Things are gonna be a little bit different for this video because unlike most of the movies that we talk about, this one's been seen by maybe 397 people, not counting us, so that's 399, so. Anna Sophia Robb plays the eponymous Samantha. You may recognize her even though she's usually a blonde, from Bridge to Terabithia, Violet Beauregard in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, that uh, oh. wonderful Tim Burton abortion. She was also in Race to Witch Mountain. After we watched this, and I knew we were going to talk about it, I went ahead and watched all of these just to get a better sense of this young woman so I could really do a deep and thoughtful analysis of her performance here. So mm -hmm. prepare to be disappointed. As far as Race to Witch Mountain goes, the originals are much better, let me just say. Like, those were, like, some of my childhood movies. Are they? Yeah. Bet oh, I didn't see this one, to be fair, but better, I should I'm sure. Not. The only other, well, I guess there are a couple of other uh, actresses. None of the actors in here mattered at all. Uh, but uh, notably, Samantha's grandmother 
which who she, whom she calls Grand Mary because it's her grandmother, Mary. Not a not a lot of work was put in there. Uh, played by Mia Farrow, probably isn't as as recognizable a name today as it was back when this came out, or certainly for decades before that. Sadly, probably most famous for being married to certified creeper Woody Allen and also becoming his mother-in-law when he divorced her and married her adopted daughter. Hmm. Not sure that this informs her involvement in this movie. My gut says no. I don't think so. But it's fun to think about. Not really. It's not fun. About it. <laughs> fun? Shit. She was Rosemary in Rosemary's Baby. That's probably her most notable role that wasn't in a Woody Allen movie. Even though it was directed by another noted creeper, Roman Polanski. So this woman just can't catch a break. And we honor her by putting her in Samantha, an American girl holiday. An American girl holiday. Morp Morpic and Grip Holiday. The one other that I feel I need to point out, even though she's not like big and famous or anything like that, but it's someone we both recognized when we were watching it. Rebecca May. Um, I mean, I would say like definitely notable. Yeah, she's recognizable. She's been in things re relatively recently. Once upon I, a time was a big deal at one point. That's right. I, yeah, you're right. She was. Yeah, but she was green in that. So right, she was. Well, yeah, but that's what I knew her from. She wasn't green right. for the whole thing. Zelina. Zelina. Not Elphaba, which is what we all know is her real name. The one from the play, mm -hmm. not the one from the book. Fuck that book. Like I said, the main reason I brought it up was just because I recognized her from Lost. She was one of the re recurring but lesser characters. She didn't have nearly as much screen time as most of the other people. Um, she plays... Uh, did I say her name? Rebecca Mater. It's Rebecca Mater, in case I haven't said that already. She plays mm -hmm. uh, Samantha's uncle, Guard who I, I think his name's short for Gard, 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 Gardner? I think it's Gardner. Gard, Gardanius? It could, Hildegard, something like that. She's his main squeeze. They get married in the movie. It's a whole thing. Uh, and she's, or, or Samantha's initially chilly to her, but then she warms up to her and whatever. It's the whole thing. Let's, let's just get into it. Not unlike with the casting talk. Because this movie has been seen by basically no one, uh, we're, we're just kind of go through it scene by scene and uh actually sort of talk you through it you may be able to find it and watch along if you want maybe on the very platform on which we're talking about it maybe for free uh, maybe i can't technically and that's silly that. so i have something written down that i need to just find in a second where i did write a little bit about it because i had i had two american girl dolls and my sister had one I and i was very into them when i was younger I, yes how did you not tell me this i don't know i thought i did <laughs> no this entire time i thought you were just as blind as i was huh well oh no 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 i was like super into it inform us i do have to locate it later or in a moment while she's doing that, I'm just going to offer a blanket apology to all people who, young ladies or, or guys, you know, it's 2020, who really like American Girl dolls. I'm obviously not the core audience. I never have been, not for this movie, not for any product they've ever produced. Um, and I do know at least one person, my dear cousin, who, at least growing up, really liked American Girl dolls. And there's a slim chance that she's actually watching this so if you're if you're watching, you know who you are. I'm so sorry. Also, the return of rough cuts because no no multi camera here, so that's gonna be fun. So um, most of this information I just got right off of um, either like the American Girl doll wiki or like just directly from the American Girl doll website. It's changed a lot since I had an American Girl doll. Now it has a big focus on a line called Just Like You, um, which they may have altered the name a little bit where you can like customize a doll to look like you. So you can like get a certain eye color, like hair, color and length, like you can get outfits that you match with your doll. So it's like very like customizable now. Only if you're American, I assume. No exports. No, no. Nope. I had these magazines that I would go through. I never actually got one of the, the Just Like You dolls or whatever. But they were initially released in um, 1986 by the Pleasant Company. They were sold with an accompanying, uh, accompanying book um, that is written for girls who are at least eight years old 
and they endeavored to cover significant topics such as child labor, child abuse, poverty, racism, slavery, animal abuse, and war in manners appropriate for the understanding and sensibilities of their young audience. It includes many dolls uh, covering many time periods. It began with Samantha Parkington, who was a Victorian era doll or oh, so this is child. This is, this is whatever. Iron Man. This is the Iron Man of the American yeah. cinematic <laughs> Let's uh, let's 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 uh, break into the scene by scene, shall we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we should also technically give you a spoiler warning if you. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> spoilers. First scene, it's 1904, Edwardian period. Samantha Parkington lives in Mount Bedford, New York, which I should point out is not a real place, with her grandmother Mary, Grand Mary. Uh, her next door neighbor, Eddie Ryland, is a turd who's bad at math. Little shit. <laughs> and her parents are dead. Story kicks off with the arrival of Eddie's family's new servants, the O'Malley family. And the eldest O'Malley daughter, Nellie, is around Samantha's age. So naturally, best friends right off the bat. So Samantha leaves the servants to run back home and ends up uh, trying to tell... Her grandmother and her excitement about the new neighbors. She seems to be a very, you know, traditional grandmother who just, you know, practice, go handle your things and whatnot, and doesn't want to hear any of it. She's apparently very good at the piano. Very good. I, uh, Suspiciously good. Very good. And then we transition out to a scene where she meets up with um, her friend Nellie again and offers to teach her to read, which is very nice. Yeah, but she's supposed to be folding the and fucking also, laundry. She's letting her work. She's working while she talks. You can't it's read fine. and laundry. It sort of, uh, it sort of sets up their friendship too very nicely because they're they're basically like they have parallel stories, just different classes. Because her mother's passed away, Samantha's mother's dead, and obviously her locket has her picture in it because she was like oh, my mother too. So well, I, I, mean, I think it, we have proof of that. that. Inside it just says. Uh, I think. It just. I says, think also I had American Girl dolls. It's just picture party naked. Mother. I don't know. Spoiler alert. That's a picture. <laughs> they're the same person. Ooh, that would be a twist. Or like they're, they're siblings. Half siblings. Whoa. Same mother. Whoa. 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 Whoa, we've just blown this whole thing wide open. Yeah, so I, I guess at this point, they were more establishing Samantha's relationship with her grandmother. Grandmother's very traditional. You don't talk to the help. And... Samantha is less traditional. She likes talking to the help and talks to, talks to them in the kitchen all the time and all this stuff. And oh shit, she got a package from Uncle Guard. Gotta go check that out. Inside is what they call a stereopticon, even though it's not one. It's a stereoscope. Stereopticon is a projector with two projectors. Oh, you know, one of those like... Yeah, a viewmaster. A stereoscope. A stereopticon yeah. is, a, a, is a projector that has two projectors that they could use to, like, smoothly transition between two clips of footage. Just thought I should point that out. That said, not exactly inaccurate because stereoscopes have often historically referred to as stereopticons, even though they're not the same thing. So it makes sense that Grand Mary wouldn't know the difference because she, I don't know, probably doesn't have eyes well she doesn't seem the type to really delve into things just kind of like she's had these i'm whole just gonna life sit here and do my needle point for granted so we cut to the next scene which uh is the girls outside samantha's showing off her fancy fancy new toys and talking about going to the expo and peanut butter uh and all these other things which ellie could never hope to kind of experience on her own mm -hmm. just because of that difference between their classes. She makes a faux pas and mentions Samantha's parents, and then we learn that they were both dead in her locket. There is, in fact, a picture of them both. It's allegedly. Also, mm -hmm. I think it's important it's to note that she claims it was an accident. On a boat in the river. We'll mm -hmm. see about that. A, a likely story. And then it would just commence commence the reading lessons where it's just you know showing them bonding and she seems she seems to be picking up really well because was she just holding the book and looking at it and just talking it was but because it looked like she was reading while they were walking but she's had less than one lesson at this point well this i'm sure this little montage is meant to kind of like signify the passage of some sort of time nice okay so yeah it's, it's, it's a rocky montage so get this we cut two Servant girl, Nellie, beating the crap out of a rug with a modified tennis racket, we'll say. Samantha is reading a book that's 
almost certainly below her reading level at this point. Uh, apparently written by Dr. Seuss some, I don't know how many years before he was even born. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of rhyming words. It's like watching The Electric Company, but much, much worse. She trades beating the carpet for reading. Nellie apparently learned a lot from their little walk on the beach because she now knows how to pronounce any rhyme, any word that rhymes with at. And then suddenly they're interrupted by Nellie's dad coming by to A, prove that he, the actor couldn't be bothered to rustle up an Irish accent, uh, but also that Uncle Guard, hey, he just showed up randomly. Oh, we also found out that, that Nellie's sister hasn't talked since their mother died. And this writing is just mm, impeccable. So in this very next scene, we have Guard and Zelina. Cordelia. Whatever her name is. They arrive home, uh, and Samantha runs out to meet them, and of course is immediately worried that, you know, there's this strange lady here who's going to take all of Guard's attention away from her, I'm sure. But uh, Cordelia seems pretty cool, and of course immediately gives her a gift, which is a copy of Wizard of Oz, which is hilarious. Um, because once upon a time, many, many years later. Yeah, um, that's how she got the part, I imagine. Is they, they were like, we saw you in Samantha, an American Girl Holiday, and we just loved it. And she was like, can you be the Wicked Witch? In of what? In, in, in Samantha what? <laughs> I didn't think you, you would read the second page of my book. <laughs> and then they head inside, and it is very clear right away, too, that Grand Mary does not quite like Cordelia. She's very much, oh, you should tell me whenever you bring guests, blah, 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 blah. I think part um, of that was just so that exactly was it was a surprise. She was clutching her pearls. She has a delicate constitution because she's a woman in 1904. So I suppose she, she, she yeah. could have died. That's true. That's fair. Very, very not cool of guard. And then the scene closes out when uh, Samantha drags Gardner off to go for a joy ride, because what else are people going to do in these old times, but fill it with just doing things not yeah. slowly this time going quite fast it, it was old time so they had to they had to find ways to fill the day and so just driving <laughs> and car, drive, cars were still a novelty so yeah it looks like mr toad's wild ride it's one of those old model t era mm. it's a pretty cool car but suddenly we're at dinner apparently cornelia is a suffragette and grand mary doesn't understand democracy to quash the awkward chit chat on the subject guard uh decides and he should change the subject to marriage. The two crazy kids want to get married this very July, and Samantha does not like that at all. Does she have a crush on her uncle? Who knows? You know how, like, you're introduced to an actor and actress in one role, and then every other role is, like, colored by that? Absolutely. In this case, the color of green. Yeah. I just keep expecting her to become a terrible, horrible person, just like Zelina. Well, not, she's not a ter terrible, horrible person. There were other things at play, but I just keep expecting, like, that, the twist or whatever. She's just so nice. Too nice, I say. Mighty suspicious. That's what I know. We don't That's know anything about her. That's what I was the whole time thinking. So. Yeah. So uh, the, in the scene here, a guard finds Samantha sitting off on her own in view of the water, looking at her pictures on the little, whatever that thing is called. Viewmaster. Sure. So the, the, the viewfinder. Yes. Yeah, um, view, and they have a little heart-to-heart -heart about um, guard trying to kind of make Samantha feel better about all the change that she is resistant to. They talk about her mother and how she's very like her mother, and she and uh, Cornelia would have been friends, and you know, everything's going to be all right. And then, of course, Guard realizes that part of the reason Samantha's so upset is because their arrival and Cornelia being there has kept them going to the expo that she was so excited about. Regardless, it's all... It doesn't really matter. Cornelia's the point fault. is Cornelia yeah. is a bitch and Samantha... She's changing everything and things are terrible. Immediately. Or terrible. in a boating accident. Samantha did it the whole time because she Anywho. found out about the affair later in, in the parlor or some other room in the house. Samantha's talking to Grand Mary. She's trying to get Grand Mary to admit that she doesn't like Cornelia either. And uh, Grand Mary obviously won't admit it because, you know, etiquette. She basically tells Samantha that change is going to happen no matter what. So just get fucking used to it. And then Samantha's hanging out with Nellie outside. And Cornelia continues trying to buy points by asking Samantha and Nellie to, like, taste test the two cakes that... But this wedding is coming together really quickly, isn't it? Taste testing the we two cakes. Stuff moving, man. Yeah, right. Uh, and they decide which one is best for the wedding. And even though they both answered wrong, almond vanilla is a million times better than lemon cake. She endears herself lemon to Nellie, but not as good as 
almond vanilla. I mean, come on. You can really taste the cyanide. It reminds me of dying. Delicious. Uh, mm, fair. Anyway, Cornelia endears herself to Nellie at least, but Samantha will have none of it. I do feel like it was surprising. Well, not surprising twist, I guess, for for Grand Mary to sort of like agree with something and, and not have like any resistance to it when it's brought up with the change, which well, I mean, yeah. that's a life lesson, obviously, that like, we all yeah, learn, was... but like... <laughs> she she obviously did not feel exactly the way that she was saying, but she knew it was the right thing to say. She she needs to adjust Fair. too, but she's, she's, she's teaching a child. So so uh, fitting time, and then uh, Grand Mary kind of describes her wedding dress, and um, I feel like it's really just a kind of scene that, like, once again serves as like the dividing point where she has you know the old sensibilities and like classical taste and. Um, I don't think they say what color her dress is, but the the fabric they bring out for uh, Cornelia's dress is like a lavender, which I don't feel no, like is super I think traditional that was, even at that time. I think that was the... Uh, oh, was it for Samantha? Yeah, it was her bridesmaid's dress, I think. Her favorite color? Oh, that makes more sense then. And then we hard cut <laughs> to later that night. Hard cut. Where Samantha happens to hear from the next room, guard and Grand Mary talking about after the wedding, she thinks that they're going to send her away to New York on her own. He uses the word burden in the context of, well, let us share the burden because, you know, Grand Mary's old and, you know, they want to take care of her. But of course, she only hears we're sending her away. She's a burden. Classic. She's just classic the worst. So she runs off, uh, wakes up Nellie, and then they run away together to the boathouse to talk about their dreams and wishes and their respective dead parents. The boathouse, the logical and place then, to uh, hang out when you're thinking about you your know. parents who died in a boating accident. Which kids? Coincidence? Huh. That's returning to the scene of the crime. Oh, shoot. She hasn't learned not to do that yet. No one's looking for her. Um, and then in a very touching moment that solidifies their friendship, Samantha uh, asks Nellie to keep her mother doll because she doesn't trust anyone else. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. And then they wish on a star. It's very nice. I'm sure that nothing bad will happen in the <laughs> next scene. Not at all. Okay, so they fall asleep in the boathouse. The next morning, Eddie finds them rats them out like the piece of shit that he is uh, and Eddie's mom gives Nellie a right talking to about how she's a servant she better start fucking acting like one and of course Samantha leaps to Nellie's defense uh, claiming quite accurately that it was her idea and uh, Nellie shouldn't be punished Nellie apologizes anyway and then after this little episode Samantha family kind of they go to the boathouse and they discover her shrine to her mother and Grandma realizes that she needs to get out of Mount, what is it? Mount Mount Bedford. So the next scene, she's sitting with Grand Mary, and Grand Mary's just like, "Yeah, you're gonna go live with Uncle Guard in the city for a few months, and also you're a lot like your mom because when her cat went missing, she also took all of the cat's things and made a little shrine in the boat. <clears throat> Not unusual behavior at all. Yes. So the boat. So her mother was a cat. Obviously, yes. It's implied oh, yeah. that her mother was both a cat and that her mother's cat died. So. It was the cat yes. of a cat that died and was enshrined. Was, in and both are dead. Yes. Suspiciously. Got it. Also, it should be noted that Nellie's father <clears> suddenly <throat> does have at least a slight Irish accent. So not sure if... Uh, he had a slight Irish accent on a couple words before. Well, that's the thing. <clears> like like a couple. He's, he's like a, he's a cultural <laughs> Irish, but uh, all American. So. He's been in New York for a while. Good point. Finally, we jump ahead to the summertime and therefore the wedding. Samantha comes down the stairs in her pretty lavender dress. It's an all right dress. And then we, we cut to uh, everyone getting ready. Uh, Grand Mary seems to have come around on Cornelia and gifts her some sort of jewelry to wear during the wedding. And then there's a, a small girl. I don't... Uh, Agatha, I think her name was. I don't know. How is she related to them? I believe she said that her flower girl was her sister's daughter. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, so the the small child picks up the pretty veil and is twirling around with it and playing with it, and it catches fire on on a candle. And then, you know, of course, the Cornelia is upset about it, but forgives her because she's just so flippin' nice for some reason. No, she slapped. Um, it. Sam- all know it. <laughs> um, Samantha runs out to the boathouse, gets her mother's veil, and gives that to Cordelia, and therefore. Uh, or, you know, it's signifying that <clears throat> she's fully accepted into the family and everyone loves her now. You're my uh, mom. And then we have the actual wedding. So pretty, so nice, it's very rich. Flowers fall as they pull the thing after they say their vows, and it's very nice. So as Katie mentioned, this, this ceremony was very traditional, I think. I don't know a lot about Edwardian. It seemed wedding. to be. 
Uh, during the reception, Samantha once again demonstrates the value of not eavesdropping, because apparently she just has a knack for overhearing shitty things and wildly misinterpreting them also, because, you know, kids are dumb. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, some trollops at a, one of the tables at the reception are talking about how, oh, how unlucky Cornelia is because, oh, she'll only have been married for a month and she's already a mother uh, because, I don't know, I don't know. Oh, and the point is after they get back from the honeymoon, they're going to go stay in Samantha, they're going to go to New York. So that's that's the that's the relevant plot detail. <clears throat> so we open the scene this time with Nellie and Samantha running off to hide in some of the little trees and whatnot on the yard. And Nellie drops the fact that she stole Eddie's uh, jar of money, which... You know, this they, they take to church and donate it, uh, but could have been a really bad thing because it, it she what they well, well, I mean, like, but it, it could have ended very poorly because but she got yelled at for just like falling asleep in the boathouse and now she's done like stole someone's money. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it turned out fine. Right. They donated it. Uh, well, I mean, everything the church benefited, so I guess. Sure. But everybody apparently knows uh, so gets, what happened. So. Yeah, there was there was a, a a baseball round moment where it just like cut between everybody, and they're like, "Oh, that darn kid!" Oh no, blah, blah, blah. And they were flashing. Eddie looking it, pissed. Curveball or whatever. I don't yeah. like baseball. But yeah, so it was donated at church. Seemed to be fine. <clears throat> and then we jump ahead a little bit to Samantha and Nellie saying goodbye as Samantha and uh, her new parents get ready to go to New York. It was a very long church service, I think is the point. Well, you know, if they had to get the shots of everybody. They were in church for a whole month. So we're in New York and Samantha does this um, does a voiceover to explain to Nellie everything that's been happening. She saw the Flatiron Building, ate roasted chestnuts, is apparently enrolled in school, which is kind of weird because i guess the wedding was in july so august that would have been about the right time but at the same time she's only gonna be there for a few months was the school system really that rigid and to, to, was truancy even a thing obviously not Nelly, anyway. summer school yeah i enrolled in school kind of weird uh all the other students find her inability to pronounce hudson way funnier than it is i mean don't get me wrong hudson's not a hard word to say and she hasn't exhibited any other, kids. any other speech impediments. So that seems kind of odd. I guess it was probably just because she was nervous. But either way, um, the kids in school are bitches. The teacher was less of a bitch. And yeah, and she, you know, she wrote, back, wrote back to Nellie. We cut to Nellie. Nellie's like, oh, my dad's sick. This is another voiceover. This is how they communicate. It's just voicemail back and forth. My dad appears to be slightly under the weather hope nothing happens well the the that sickness too it, when um i think when he first walked up when they were like with the rug or something he walked up like coughing into a handkerchief or whatever or like into his hand or something oh it was the consumption. i'm just saying he did he did you know he walked up <laughs> i almost so said something like, then but then i didn't because i forgot it's not so bad i beat it and i was only one think of what i could do now so we start at dinner where it took me a second to realize what they were even talking about because I didn't hear that first word. And then it just was so silly that they were talking about having, I think it was a shower installed. Oh, yes. Uh, because it was new and cra and just weird and water rained down and it was just so fancy they had to have it. And it was, shower like rain? It like literally took me like halfway through that little conversation to realize what they were actually talking about because I was like, shower. Remember, but guys, anywho. it's 1904. In case you from all the pictures that say 1904 explicitly on them. And then it cuts to school, I'm assuming the next day, uh, where the teacher announces a contest to write about something modern and new that will have 12 winners who will present their speeches to the entire school. The girls are like, phones, factories, oh, these modern things, very exciting. And then we cut to a suffragette meeting where Cornelia is talking about uh, the need to make changes and that there's a presentation coming up or a, a meeting or something where they're going to go talk, which seems to parallel the school's speeches pretty well. That's new and modern. Why doesn't she talk about, you know, women being treated like people as an idea? So would probably go over a gang bus so, in all girls school. So, you know, the factories, her friend who worked in a factory and now she goes immediately to a meeting where they talk about the need for change and women's wrote, like rights to choose. 
very nice parallel there. Oh, I definitely see the parallel. Um, oh, yeah. And then a woman comes up and, you know, tries to, you know, make sure Samantha definitely commits to voting one day. And Cornelia reminds them that it's the choice we're fighting for, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Dirty communist. Very exciting. Uh, but, yeah, so, you know, getting them parallels ready. Setting up setting up the uh, some upcoming stuff, it sounds like. In the next scene, Samantha is practicing her speech that somehow is still about factories, despite the heavy, you know, heavy hitting of the of the previous scene about suffrage you never know she could have had heard it and changed her mind i don't know uh anyway factories uh she talks about how great factories are for a while and you know machines do all the work and somehow they still create jobs and guard agrees that it's great and uh because he's just being nice or maybe isn't smart enough to see the dangers of industrialization and then Cordelia comes in, Cornelia, sorry, comes in with the mail and reveals that, hey, Nellie's dad just fucking died. Who dies of influenza? So, yeah, the scene closes with another voiceover, Samantha. Oh, I guess Nellie and the girls are now in a nearby orphanage. Guard says he'll go get the address. They're going to go there. They're going to visit. It's going to be happy, fun times for all at the local orphanage. So we open once again on Samantha playing the piano. Uh, Cornelia walks in and sits down to listen, going through mail or something. I don't know what she's doing. And then Samantha plays for like 10 years. It's true. It was a very long uh, song. It was very long. And then Samantha goes to sit with Cornelia. Uh, they talk about Samantha's mother and her hatred for chickens. Uh, guard returns and has news of the orphanage in that he went there, but he wasn't able to see Nellie because only related visitors are allowed. So Cornelia comes up with a plan to have a rich couple, the Vanderbeeks, who always donate to places all over the city. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what she said, but it definitely started with Vander something. <laughs> to put together a donation of some sort so they can deliver it and that will get them on the inside. Right, because they couldn't adjust. So they can see what's going on they said non-relatives or people who are unless they're serious about it very serious about very adopting serious about very serious why make this a wily coyote she can't situation? because there'll be gossip she she's demons she's a suffragette she doesn't give a shit about that okay so they're not relatives they're not serious about adoption and cornelia well she's got connections so Cornelia and Samantha go in on what's known as a stealth mission, also known as the worst part of video games. So, yeah, they, they head in there, and it the place is... They, they meet with the, 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 the headmistress or whatever she her official title is, Mrs. Frouchy, a name that could literally only have been concocted for this exact purpose because it evokes stern german woman who also happens to be grouchy so just a just a stern german woman because they're making such a sizable donation cornelia asks for a tour and the woman's face just immediately goes from like sort of <laughs> oh. different ass kissing <laughs> to oh my god hide the dead kids in the closet uh so they they go on a quick walk through and they go through the first floor or whatever where the the girls up to age nine are kept and samantha spots nelly's apparently both mute younger sisters and has to tell them shh, shh don't give us away i'm on your side i'm on the inside or whatever and then they go up to the nine to 16 floor a pretty large group to keep young girls in a lot of difference between a nine to 16 year old girl anyway <laughs> uh and you know while cornelia sort of provides distraction does a little song and dance number and whatever samantha spots nelly and goes in and they, they make a clandestine plan i guess nelly has somehow netted the sole job she's the only one who can do it of dumping ash in the alley <clears throat> outside it's the only time she gets to go outside every day at four o'clock i don't know why none of the other kids do it why why aren't there shifts this seems like they're setting her up for an escape but either way, Samantha says, I'll meet you in the alley at four o'clock tomorrow, whatever. And see. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's a good thing she probably like pitched a fit about not being able to see her sisters and got that duty because as you, it is a perfect opportunity. Plot device, plot device. You'd think they'd be smarter than I. Just like the candle, plot you know, device. I love when you say that. 
I love it. I love it. <laughs> Plot device. That makes it okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Plot device. It's like a Band-Aid that you just slap over. It just says plot device right on it. Boom. It doesn't matter. It's a plot device. The next scene opens at school. We seem to be flipping between school and dinner and orphanage. the orphanage and what have you now. But, yes, so we're at school. And Samantha sets up a basket in the back of the class for a coat collection for the orphanage. A couple snotty bitches roll their eyes when they find out that's what she's doing. Because, uh, what? Well, no, one of them was a snobby bitch. The other one was sort of the classic oh, yeah. mean girl trope of, like, she's what? actually nice, but she's too spineless to say anything. Yeah, so the, the the one girl was like, why why do you need our old coats? That's gross. And then when she left the other girl, and the other girl was like, I have some old pregnant in for you. So she was okay. And then we cut to Samantha and Cornelia returning to the orphanage, and then Cornelia heads inside with some more stuff and talk to people, and Samantha books around the back to meet up with Nellie. She brings her food and finds out that Nellie has been threatened to be sent to the farm on the orphan train if she misbehaves and never see her sisters again awesome and honestly uh well i was gonna say it kind of sounds like they're gonna kill her (laughs) it does actually she she took the train to the farm Yep, orphan train to the farm (laughs) now they went to live on a farm upstate which sounds great and just goes to kind of drive the point you know with with all american girl stories that they have that accompany that various dolls like just to to illustrate like well yeah illustrate like what was going on at that time and all that fun stuff. The next scene is Thanksgiving. They're eating a turkey. Did people eat Thanksgiving on turkey back in 1904? 1863, I looked it up. Oh, well, that's thanks for making me look like a stupid f- The point of the, the whole point of that like maybe 20 second scene is that Samantha's essay got selected. The next scene is much more exciting. It 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 pay it's a payoff for all the the boringness of the stealth mission from a couple of scenes ago. It's a heist. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's basically a heist. So Samantha, clever little minx that she is, tells the woman that guards the front door or whatever at Coldstone Creamery Orphanage or whatever it's called, tells her that she's making a donation of coats in a clearly empty basket. And they do this all the time. She usually just leaves it in the coat closet in freaking Miss Frouchy's bedroom or whatever office. So... The woman just says, oh, okay, whatever, that sounds good. So Samantha goes in there, she meets Nellie in the alley and tells her to grab her sisters and meet, I'm probably getting this a little out of order, meet them at the coat closet, which is apparently just something that she can do. I mean, if she can just- I guess. If she could just grab her two sisters and walk into the headmistress's office and hide in a closet, why can't she just grab them and go outside and jump the fucking fence? But anyway. Well, because she was at the door, I guess. Well, and to be fair, Katie, you you know the answer. Of exactly Hold right the device. Thank you. The one time that I want you to say it, and I had to get it out of you. They're in there. They're hiding in the closet. And then Miss Frouchy returns unexpectedly with her, I don't even, did they say where the money was coming from? Doesn't matter. The point is, the orphanage got a donation. She's walking around with this fat stack of bills making it rain. And she goes over to the safe and she opens the safe, and she puts eh, probably about 75% of it in there and tucks the rest into her waistband, which, of course, the kids Not cool. notice, but are too stupid to know what the hell it means, probably. And then one of the one of the girls, the one that's hiding under the desk, the unlucky one, the one that drew the short straw, just, just can't stifle a sneeze. Sneezes. Miss Frouchy hears. The girls jump out of the closet. She trips over the one that's crawling over out from under the desk. They run for the door. The woman who was guarding the door before is nowhere to be seen for some reason, Katie. What? For some reason. I don't know what you mean. So, they <laughs> yeah, they, they run outside. Miss Frouchy runs outside, grabs a, a constable and says, Yo, my babies were stolen. Because, you know, property. and money and all of the money, not, not 30 percent, all of it. And uh, the cop just he blows his whistle once, sees the girls in the distance, says, eh, it's too far. That's it. That's the whole thing. So immediately after the big jailbreak, Samantha sneaks the girls all the way home, which I guess they're still in New York. So it's probably not that far, I guess. Um, and up into the attic to hide out. Yeah, no, I <laughs> Three girls running through New York. I mean, I got the impression 
like when when guard said, "Hey, I'm going to go find this orphanage." It almost seemed like he like stepped outside and looked across the street and was like, "Oh." There it is. It was that, it was that lickety split. So, they uh they get them home. Uh crude uh who I guess is like the housemaid set up like beds and clothes and food for them. Um and then uh they all, you know, kind of reiterate the fact that they have to stay hidden because they belong to the state, which is cool. Frouchy ends up showing up to the house to ask after Samantha, accusing her of having been at the orphanage, sneaking out the girls, and stealing money, which is super rude. I mean, they they had practice stealing money, you know, months previous, so... Anyway, turned to a life of crime yeah. that night um the girls worry you know continuously together up in the attic room nelly talks about having to get a job so they can get a room of their own to you know just remind us of the times and then it cuts a little bit later to dinner with with cornelia and guard and gertrude just like updating them and telling them that frouchy showed up and was accusing these things of having been done and cornelia decides they have to do something something anything Yes. She's a Help. So, <laughs> in the next couple of scenes, Samantha plays the piano a little bit more. You know, you can't go too long without her playing the piano. We might As she do. She can play the piano. So she plays the piano for about three seconds on camera and then continues playing the piano while she walks up and into the next room, takes some food off the dinner table. I guess Gertrude is taking too Gertrude? Was it Gertrude? Yes. The help it was taking too long to get stuff off the table so she's just like i'll take this loaf of bread and this milk run up the stairs won't look suspicious at all nobody noticed nelly and the girls ate and had full bellies and were happy for the rest of their lives and then samantha's in her room writing grand mary <laughs> foreshadowing about hey new york is great and now that nelly's here the only person missing is you i wonder how the movie will end <laughs> they all also die the admiral winter 1904 Four? Yes, it's four for the fifth time. 1904. Bridget is sick. And of course, Nellie is nowhere to be found. Um, so the little girl whose name I can't remember. Uh, Hester or something. Hester. I um, sneaks downstairs, Hester. sneaks past everybody, finds Samantha sitting in a room and takes her upstairs to find out that Bridget is sick. So instead of going to Cornelia, which I think would make the most sense, Samantha leaves the house, goes to the factory where Nellie apparently got a job, just walks in with no one to stop her, which I guess if they want kids to work there, sure. Sees exactly what goes on in the factory. Sees a kid get his hand caught in the sewing machine, which makes me feel physically ill just thinking about. Yeah, it was pretty bad. It's the most real this movie's gonna get. Yeah, well, and as, as like someone who's used a sewing machine, like, and like knows, like, just like imagining that happening, blah, blah. Anyway, literally sees that, like, there's just a line of kids. Like, one kid either leaves or gets hurt. They just, like, cycle through the rest. She finds Nellie. They rush home. And by rush home, I mean they slowly stroll through the streets discussing the fact that Nellie has to work at the factory and didn't tell her. And then they finally get home to check on Bridget, who is getting worse. And I can only assume they finally have decided to tell an adult. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would hope. Thank so. God. <laughs> But you never know. Since apparently they've been living in the attic for months and just for months, gone, at least at least a couple months. There. Yeah. Well, it's it's at least what at from, least a couple at least of weeks because it was Thanksgiving into, into winter. Wait a minute. No, they had Thanksgiving, so it was it was after Thanksgiving. It hasn't quite been Christmas yet. But that's it. It says winter 1904. Winter starts four days before Christmas. Is this literally like this is like December 22nd that this is the happening? day before Christmas? <laughs> I think they mean like the winter season. Who maybe in nineteen oh four it was different. On the twenty first of December. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Maybe it hadn't wobbled yet, so it was still <laughs> it started back in November. <laughs> the next scene begins with Samantha coming downstairs and explaining to her dear Unky Guard and Auntie Corey. You heard me. That she Well, exactly what happened. You we we already explained it. You know. She she kidnapped some orphans. It was a minor offense, let's be fair, to save them from a life of being orphans. So they go up. Obviously, their first priority, because they're not complete assholes, is to get a doctor over to examine the sick kid. Doctor comes, says, oh, she's very dehydrated. That's his entire diagnosis. Very easily fixed by, I don't know, drinking some water and then some more water. Water? I'm not saying it's not serious, but... The medicine is not prescription level at all. <laughs> he leaves, says he'll be back in the morning to check on her. 
and then they go down the 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 three Parkingtons, I guess you would say. Parkinson? Parkinson? Park 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 Samantha's park, last park, name. Park places? Yes. The three park places. Go down to the you know, the lounge or whatever fancy rooms they have in this house and guard explains to her that she broke the law and even though it's stupid they have to report the fact that the orphans are staying there and i'm probably missing some point oh yeah there's also this weird little uh call back to that that scene at the wedding where samantha once again doesn't learn her lesson about listening to conversations she's not a part of with the whole oh the she's a burden that whole vibe the thing that's kind of been riffing on this whole time so we get a nice little heartfelt moment where cornelia confirms to her that she actually really likes having her in the family and that her friends are bitches her words bitches in this made for tv bitches. movie directed at like girls eight <laughs> to twelve we start off at the orphanage um and mrs vanderpuff is checking in with frouchy to see what's going on frouchy is you know saying she's not going to press charges as long as the money is returned and instead vanderpuff says actually uh you're being replaced because look at that fancy coat you done stole the money yeah so she's being replaced she heads out with cornelia who is waiting outside and off they go we cut to the speech at the school the snotty girl from earlier finishes her speech about how amazing and you know worthwhile and american factories are Mm. To be followed up by Samantha, who talks about what she actually saw in the factory with the, you know, the horrible conditions, kids being kept there, who can't go to school because they're tired, kids getting hurt, all this horrible stuff. And that, you know, I have a hard time hmm. listening to a child speaking out for children's rights. It's just so obvious they have an agenda. Just so. uh, I mean, it might have had something to do with the fact that, you know, the kid got his hand messed up by a sewing machine. Maybe he was. And, gone. you know, she declares. That's true. And she declares, you know, if we've made factories that have hurt our children, we have not made the progress we thought we have, and things need to be fixed. After the speech, uh, Grand Grand Mary shows up to surprise her and, you know, to congratulate her on such a wonderful speech. And her beau, the Admiral, is there too. It's so exciting. This Admiral we've heard about the whole movie. The teacher comes up and is telling her that she's disqualified because she changed her speech and it wasn't cleared. Grand Mary shuts that shit down and uh, basically tells her, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, she, you know, the whole, uh, well, I don't think it gets her undisqualified. She's going to like magically get to win now. No, no, but you know, she's she's kind of turned around her her whole mentality and is open to the change that everyone has been talking about the whole movie. Yeah, it's a moment for um, her, really. Okay. It takes it takes two to tell the truth, one to say it and one to listen. <laughs> so inspirational. Is it on the way back to the house, Samantha using her well honed talent for emotional manipulation? subtly suggests that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Uncle Guard and Aunt Corny could use a little more help around the house. You know, Gertrude's getting on in years. She's probably going to die soon. And with Samantha coming to visit more often, they're going to need more help, like maybe three more small Irish helps. Guard and Corny, they distract Samantha, knowing full well that they couldn't possibly satisfy her or whatever. Uh, by telling her that uh, Grand Mary and the Admiral are officially getting married, so Grand Mary won't be all alone in Mount Bedford, so she'd li- they'd like for her to come and live with them permanently in the Big Apple. By the next scene, they're all there. They're celebrating Christmas, uh, leaving out cookies and notes for Santa. It's, it's, so, it's so fucking saccharine, I can barely even repeat it. But basically, the Christmas wish is that no, the big reveal is that guard and corny don't need more help around the house but they do need more kids and samantha three needs more. more three more bright-eyed bushy-tailed <laughs> irish uh yeah cheerins uh, to be Samantha's sister. So they're adopting the three kids is, is to the point of this screed of mine. Finally, at, you know, at the, at the delight of this great news, Jenny all but jumps up and shouts her first line in the movie, God bless us, God bless us everyone, or something. I wasn't paying attention. 
<laughs> and then the movie yeah, ends no, with a montage much, yeah. of them them you know doing some charity work and then going on a sleigh ride sunrise sunset merry merry christmas so james yes what was, how did you feel how did this beautiful holiday film make you feel what did you think about it what did i think of some mama 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 daba doo doo and america some mama now doo 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 daba da doo 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 i mean there's not really a lot i can say that probably wasn't conveyed all too clearly in my tone throughout all of this i can't mm-hmm. judge it too harshly even when this movie <clears> came out you could even, even if i had been the right age when this movie came out it i'm a boy i was raised as a boy this kind of thing has never had any appeal to me uh for what it was I can't even say because like like this is this is so just not a kind of movie that I would ever have watched growing up as an adult. Yeah, I mean it's it's trite, it's milk toast. Uh the child actors are as child actors go, they're aggressively middling, but this is no let's say it as the first example that springs to my mind of great child actors. But for, you know, if you grew up loving American Girl and you were you know, a nine to twelve year old or whatever. I, it's I don't know shit about demographics. The point is, I can't really offer a solid indication as to whether or not I think it's any good for what it is. But I can say, from my incredibly outside of the box viewpoint, I I could not I could not recommend this movie to anyone in good consciousness. It's harmless, sure. A kid could watch it and enjoy it, but I, I can't imagine anyone as an adult looking at it and being like, that was a great piece of film. What about you, Katie? Would you recommend slam a lam ding dong uh, a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers hamburger? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Um, or were you just taking in all the words I made up? Oh, I was just, I was acknowledging. I was processing. <clears throat> um... I mean, while I was into American Girl dolls, um, my sister and I both had one. I had Molly. She had Felicity. Um, I'm pretty sure I got Josephina at some point, too. And I had, like, accessories and books from everybody. Like, literally, I don't know when exactly the age was, but, like, I pretty much forgot about that until we pulled this movie. And I was like, oh, right, those were a thing. So, I mean, it wasn't really something now that even really felt super nostalgic because I'd just forgotten about it to such a degree. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have that nostalgic factor, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that will hold your interest more. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for like a, you know, it's definitely not like a must see. Yeah. Um, Even, even as someone who like enjoys movies and will seek out movies specifically, I'd be fine if I hadn't seen it. Yeah. It's all good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. So, Perhaps the most important part of us doing this video is that we've done this video, which means we can now finally, after a year and a half, draw the second DVD from the Bull Moose grab bag of $1 DVDs. Katie, you have the bag. Yes. Would you do the honors? I do. I'm so excited. I am too. Sorry, I, I found a what American Girl doll are you quiz and I was gonna take it real quick, but well, this is more important. I have the bag. Careful, careful, you don't pick, scratch it. Pick one, pick one, pick one from the middle. It has no markings. Of course not. It does say Cinderella Man. Really? <laughs> I have no idea what that is, but... Oh, you've never seen... Sure, it'll be great. I've never seen Cinderella Man, but I know what it is. It's about... I monster. have no idea. Oh, great. Yep. You're going to love it. <laughs> what, a, what a wild ride from, from this to uh, Cinderella Man, I guess. Is, that's actually... That was like an Oscar-nominated film, if I, my memory serves. So, yeah. Really? Quite a jump. While Katie is taking her Which American Girl Doll Are You... I guess it's just which American girl are you quiz. Uh, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this very unorthodox uh, Katie and Katie. She's not listening. 
Uh, I'm taking a quiz. All right, one more. Do it again. In any case, while Katie is taking her, uh, Katie and Katie. <laughs> anyway, uh, we do have. While we might end up having to do some more of these socially distanced videos, uh, we do have a few things on the horizon. Obviously, we're not going back to the theater anytime soon, but uh, I've been writing down basically every movie that we've mentioned in our videos lately that one or the other of us hasn't seen, so we got those. We obviously have Cinderella Man now on the list. Um, Marvel shows are going to start coming to Disney Plus in just a few weeks. So while we haven't exactly figured out how we're going to approach those, we're thinking maybe we'll do a sort of preseason what we think might happen, and then maybe a midseason, and then a, an afterwards sort of a, a take on the whole thing. And yeah, are um, you talking about the Marvel movie series? I'm t yeah, I'm or the Marvel TV series? Yeah, <gasps> the Division and all that stuff. All the Hawkeye step photos. So excited! Yeah, it was it was a pretty busy week. Uh, so it, it, that's, you got that to look forward to. Unfortunately, most of the other projects on the channel are kind of on hold. Poor Taste Buds is just really not a good idea because it's about sharing food, food. So yeah, uh, until, until we're back, hopefully in not, not too long, WandaVision comes out January 15th, I think. So that'll probably be the next thing we tackle. Um, we have been Katie and Katie, Katie, and Katie. Of under 655 studios. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Well, she was an American girl. Hmm. I got Kit Kit uh Kit Kittridge. Kit Kittridge. That's a made up name. Mm -hmm. I had, well, uh, she's the one who I had in her books. What's your favorite holiday? None of these. I hate all of the okay, I, I guess I gotta do Mother's Day because Rebecca Rubin. Like the same. Never heard. Never heard. Must be one of the newer ones.